When I say medium size, there are about 3,500 students or so. That's all at the undergraduate level. But we also have um, over 800 graduate students, so students who study in master's programs. And those programs are primarily online and in the evening. Um, so during the daytime, the campus is really dedicated to you as undergraduate bachelor's degree students. Um, we are, as a state university, we're certainly going to be one of your more affordable options. Um, you'll find on like page four, I think, um, our tuition and fees. Uh, currently, tuition is just over 11,000 per year. And then room and board is somewhere going to be somewhere between 13 to 14,000 per year, depending upon if you have a roommate, your meal plan, you know, all that stuff. Um, and so it's certainly, you know, in comparison to most of the other state universities, we're going to be about the same. We'll be a little bit more affordable than the UMasses typically. Um, and then compared to most private schools, we're certainly going to be um, more affordable as well. So what that means is that the value of an education at Framingham State is going to be quite high. One of the things that's mo the most important things about our campus is our location. We're located halfway between Worcester and Boston, um, so about 20 miles from each, which means that we're in the center of the Metro West economic hub. So if you think about in terms of internships and job opportunities, job shadow programs, all of that stuff is really right around our campus. Um, and so we provide students with a whole host of opportunities to explore their professional opportunities while they're in school, simply because of how close we are to a lot of global headquarters, school districts, organizations, and different kinds of institutions and um, companies and things like that where students can start their careers and really kind of begin to think about their life after Framingham State. And so you'll see on one of the pages in there on the professional page, <clears throat> a list of all the companies that are right within our backyard. So places like Bose, TJX, Staples, um, Sanofi, Genzyme, Nike, Reebok, um, <clears throat> as well as all of the different um, opportunities right around campus for part-time work. So we are, uh, if you've, obviously, you've, I'm assuming you've all been to the Holyoke Mall. So the Natick Mall is about seven times that size. Um, so for students that are interested in like just a part-time job at the mall or, um, you know, if you're wanting to start your career in like hospitality or tourism or fashion merchandising, there's a whole host of opportunities just two miles from our campus. And our campus shuttle goes there almost every hour. So a lot of our students get part-time jobs at the mall or at the places around the mall. Um, our hospitality students will get jobs at like the hotels and restaurants and tourism centers that are there. Um, so we really feel, I feel very strongly, obviously the university pays me to say this, but I feel like the value of, a un, of an experience at Framingham State, because of that wealth of opportunities and options, really sets us apart in terms of the ways that you can start to build your resume and build your skill set before you even leave campus. Um, that also means that there's a lot to do around campus. So that mall is enormous, so there's, I've, somebody told me that there's over 200 restaurants within five miles of campus. So if you're kind of sick of the cafeteria on campus, there's a whole mess of places to go eat, um, just a short drive or shuttle bus ride away, um, including places where you can use your student ID to actually buy food at the restaurants. So like we have agreements with like Bertucci's, there's a 24-hour IHOP. Um, they're like Chipotle and Subway and a bunch of other restaurants. All you can use your student ID to buy food at those restaurants off campus. Um, that's not to say that the food on campus isn't great. We have seven different spots on campus where you can get a meal. So we have our traditional all-you-can-eat cafeteria, um, and that's open for, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, attached to that is uh, the Ram's Den Grill where you can get just like French fries and chicken wings and burgers and omelets in the morning and stuff. And that's open late at night as well. And then we've got a Dunkin' Donuts in our campus center. There's a coffee shop in the library. Um, there's a smoothie bar and a pizza joint. Um, a very short walk from us, there's an amazing ice cream place and another really good pizza place. Um, so there's a bunch of different options to keep you well fed um, while you're there. And just a couple years ago, we were voted best food of all the state universities in Massachusetts. So um, one of the things that sort of keeps us on point is we have a program in food and nutrition science. So those students certainly make sure that we've got 
uh, nutritious and delicious food on hand in our cafeteria and around campus for students. So as I mentioned, we're a medium-sized school, so about 3,300 students or so this year. Um, that means that we have uh, residence halls to accommodate, you know, the, that kind of population. So we have seven residence halls on campus. Um, over 80% of our first-year students live on campus, so the vast majority of our freshmen um, are living on campus. And then we do have a sizable number of students that join us as transfer students from community colleges. So they might start at, at STIC or HCC or the community colleges that are close to us and then transfer to us for the second two years after they get their associate's degree. Um, so we have about, this year we have about, I think somebody told me about 1,700 students living on campus. Mm -hmm. um, the residence halls range. There's, um, there's one residence hall that's over 110 years old, and then we've got one that just opened three years ago. Um, so there's everything from like that very traditional kind of old New England college feel to like very cutting edge facilities, including our, uh, our fairly new science center that just opened a couple of years ago. That student size also means that there's a lot of different options and opportunities in terms of majors and things you can become involved in. So as you can see, there's a list of over 35 different majors for you to choose from. There's also over 60 different concentrations and minors. So if you want to specialize your degree beyond your major, there's plenty of options to do that. Everything from like accounting to world languages, business management, um, as I mentioned, hospitality and tourism, fashion, nursing. There's a whole bunch of different options in there. And then certainly if you're interested in like studying a language or music or um, you want to get trained as a teacher. There's a whole bunch of different concentrations in there to help you focus your degree even more. And then on top of that, we have options for you to continue degree, your, your education after your bachelor's degree. So you can continue on and get a master's degree in business or nursing or counseling. Um, you can also think about law school. So we have a three plus three program that we work with UMass Dartmouth and Suffolk Law School. So you do three years with us and then you do three years of law school, so it saves you an entire year of school uh, through one of those programs. In addition to that, we wanna make sure that you're developing your skill set and, your, and, um, and yourself and pursuing your interests outside the classroom. So we have over 30 different student clubs and organizations. So everything from like anime club to an Afro-Caribbean dance team to cheerleading club to um, so I think there's like there's even a dentistry club for students that are interested in becoming dentists after they you know study with us. So there's a bunch of lots of clubs and organizations for um, almost every major or within a college. But there's also things like student government. There's a choir. There's a theater group. You know, a variety of other ways that if those are things that you currently do here at Holyoke High, um, that you can continue doing those things when you get to college if they're just things that you enjoy or those are skills that you want to continue to develop um, as a professional or as a student as well. Um, so we see those also as great opportunities for students to learn some leadership skills because all of those clubs and organizations have like a president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, all of that. So even those are ways that you can build your resume while you're still on campus. Um, is anyone thinking about being an athlete in college? Maybe, yeah, maybe. What sport do you play? Basketball? Yeah, women's basketball does quite well. Um, that it also, sort of the athletics also adds to your college experience. So our football team is quite good. Um, we've, uh, a couple weeks ago, we you know, beat UMass Dartmouth. We've been conference champions eight out of the last 10 years. So that makes the fall a little bit more fun if you go and watch a football team that's actually winning. Um, <laughs> Um, and then in the winter time, our women's basketball team does well. Men's basketball team is, re is rebuilding. Springtime baseball and softball are quite good. Um, so just sort of that wraps your college experience even more. If you've got something to do in a basketball game to go to on a Friday night or something like that. Um, certainly we just had homecoming as well, um, which was a great success. So we want to make sure that your whole college experience, not just your time in the classroom, you know, is really uh, that you're successful and happy and having a great time while you're there as well. And that means supporting you in all the other ways that students need support. So we have a counseling and health center that's right in the middle of campus. So if you need somebody to talk to or if you need um, some basic medical stuff, um, there's a place on campus so you don't have to go off, uh, off campus to go get some of that stuff. 
Um, that includes like career services and employer relations. So all those internship opportunities, all the you know the employers that we have around us. There's a whole office that helps you with like writing your resume, um, writing your cover letter, making sure that you're prepared to step into the professional world. We even do um, we, every year we do like a clothing drive too for students that might not have a suit or they need um, you know like clothes for a professional environment that they weren't expecting just yet. Um, and so we do a whole drive for that as well um, that students can donate to, faculty and staff donate to, and then students can go grab stuff if they need it. Because um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that when you're representing Framingham State out in the sort of real world, um, we want to make sure that you look good and that you're prepared professionally to do so. The Campus Center also houses all of our student affairs and uh, you know, all of those offices, so students, you know, if you're having an issue with a roommate or um, you want to explore an opportunity on campus or you have an idea for a new club or a new project, um, there's a whole office that helps students with that stuff also. Um, so the camp, uh, we talked a little bit about like the area around campus. Campus itself, um, although our total campus is over 75 acres, I think, the actual living, living and learning space is pretty compact. We're actually the highest point in Framingham. So in some of our residence halls on a super nice day, you can see all the way to Boston. Um, certainly out here in Western Mass, we've got some great foliage and mountains and all that to look at, but it's really kind of nice to just sort of look out your dorm room window and sort of see this fantastic landscape, which is pretty great. And the campus being pretty compact is also pretty nice in the winter time. So when you're like going to your 8.30 in the morning class in February and there's a foot of snow in the ground, um, you're not traipsing all the way across campus for a mile and a half. Um, I think somebody told me you can walk from um, the furthest building on one end to the other um, in about eight minutes. Um, and that's primarily because the rest of our campus is surrounded by our parking and athletic facilities. So all of that stuff is around campus, not right in the middle. So it means that you know, the campus space is pretty, pretty compact which I think also contributes to the way that our students kind of interact and get to know each other. You know, not being super spread out, um, you know, those 3,000 or so students are able to, it never really feels that big because it's not this big sprawling campus. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we consistently hear back from our students and faculty and staff is that, you know, even though we're over 3,000 students, the, stu the school never really f feels quite that large. Our students really report back to us that they're able to get to know each other and the sense of community and um, it's kind of corny but we call it the family um, because we're the Rams and we're in Framingham and our, it's family, yeah. Um, it, it also sort of is indicative of the way that our students kind of get to know their teachers and faculty, they get to know the staff um, on campus and we get to know that too, which is beneficial in a variety of ways. One, we're able to give you better advice about what you're studying and your professional career path, um, but also like it also means that we're as a resource there for you for letters of recommendation or references. Um, so when you go to find your first sort of real job um, or you're headed off to graduate school, you have people that can light, write you letters of recommendation and kind of give you some insight into what to expect. Um, I, we had a student a couple years ago that sort of described it he sort of said that he felt like Framingham was a place where people held the door for each other. And I think that's both literally true. Like people will hold the door for the person behind them as they're entering buildings. But it's also this great kind of metaphor for the way that our community interacts. That I think like people genuinely care about each other and respect each other. And so when there's challenges on campus, we had some incidences of racism a few years ago, the campus really rallies and comes together and sort of says, this is not who we are. This is our family. Like you're not you're not welcome here. And so that kind of messaging really gets confronted really pretty directly um, when students sort of face any sort of that sort of thing. And that does bring me to my next point about in terms of campus safety. Um, although we are like technically in a city where our campus is located in like a suburban neighborhood. So the majority of the people who walk through campus who are not students are typically our neighbors like walking their dogs or taking their kids for a walk or coming to play catch on the quad. Um, and so that means that our campus is quite safe. That includes a police force that's actually, they're trained state troopers. Um, so their responsiveness is, is really fantastic because of the, the way that our campus is pretty compact. And so they definitely like keep our students safe. And so um, we haven't had too many issues. You know, most of the issues that our students confront are sort of off campus when they're in, 
maybe places they shouldn't be. <laughs> um, but we, you know, we want to make sure that while you're on our campus grounds that you're safe and protected. The other really nice part about our location um, is that, you know, despite being a suburban campus, you have access to New England's two biggest cities in Worcester and Boston. There is a commuter train that leaves from Framingham, from downtown Framingham, that goes into Boston almost every hour from like 4.30 in the morning until midnight. So we do see students that will do have internships in the city as well. They'll take the train in and then they'll take the subway to, you know, an employer there. Um, but also students just go in for like to go catch a Celtics game or go to the museum or just have a night out. Sometimes professors might require you to go see an exhibit at a museum or go to some talk like in town as well. So um, students often take advantage of being able to take the train into the city as well. Um, and that's really kind of just like a nice perk of like where we are. And to get to all those places, we do have a campus shuttle, like I mentioned, that goes to the Natick Mall almost every hour. So it makes it really easy to have a part-time job or just go hang out and play video games at Dave & Buster's. Um, or like if you just need to get to the train station so you can get to your internship in the city um, at some point as well, the shuttle will also bring you there. Um, some common questions that we typically get are, you know, can first year students have cars? If you have a car and you want to bring it to campus as a resident student, you can certainly do that. There is an additional parking fee. Um, other questions we get, we don't have a pool. I often get that question whether or not we have a pool, but we don't, unfortunately don't have one. And as someone who swam here at Holyoke High School, it was sort of disappointing when I got to campus after I got hired and said, oh, where's the pool? And they're like, we don't have one. I'm like, oh, it's like the one college in New England that doesn't have a pool. Um, but students don't use the pool anyway. It's all for faculty and staff anyway. Um, there are, we do have workout facilities though. There's a full athletic facility. So for lifting weights and cardio machines or club volleyball or um, indoor soccer, there's a whole bunch of ways that students can stay fit and healthy um, by accessing all those resources. Um, and then we do also have this big conference center. So that's the other sort of addition to our, recent addition to our campus is that we, we own and operate the Warren Conference Center, which is about four miles from campus. And it has like tennis courts and a big lake so students can sign out kayaks and canoes and paddle boards if you want to go paddle around on the lake. And then there's also just big fields and wooded areas and hiking trails. Um, there's a frisbee golf course. Um, so some students will go over there and just to like, kind of hang out and get off campus on the grounds for a little while. And then the conference center itself, we host conferences there and like weddings and um, quinceañeras and all kinds of stuff at this conference center. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ways that like students can um, uh, get involved there too, have part-time jobs at the conference center. Um, there's even like a little bed and breakfast as well. So there's a whole host of ways that students can get part-time employment off campus, but also on campus. Um, so included in the conference center, that's one opportunity, but also we hire a couple hundred students every year to work um, on campus as well. In the library, my office, we hire a couple dozen tour guides, um, as well as, you know, dining services and student affairs and teaching assistants. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can get a job on campus as well. Um, and typically, I teach a class this semester and of my nine students, I think seven or eight of them have part-time jobs in addition to going to school. So it's fairly common for our students mm -hmm. to kind of have a part-time gig uh, while they're uh, studying. And actually, actually the, uh, the class size is also a common question. So our average class size is around 17, 18 students. Um, we cap most of our classes at 24. Um, so you'll never have like a big auditorium filled with students as a class with a ton of teaching assistants it's pretty much always going to be like a faculty member and then a class of about 18 to 20 students. Um, and then student to teacher ratio this year is about 12 to one. Um, so again, that goes back to your ability to sort of get to know your teachers, their ability to get to know you. Um, and so that really feeds into, I think, the sense of community on our campus. What else? Our application's pretty straightforward. We are a test optional school. So we do not require the SATs or ACTs, and that we did that before COVID. So we're not one of these schools that just that decided to do that last year. This is, we've been test optional for five or six years now. Um, certainly, if you have taken the SATs or ACTs and you want to include them in your application because you feel that it would strengthen it, 
certainly do so, but they're not required. We're a Common App school, so you can add us on the Common App, and then there's some additional questions for our school. Or we have our own application, which is a little bit shorter and simpler. Um, it's really up to you which, you which you decide to use. And for being here today, we'll waive your application fee, so we'll save you 50 bucks just for participating in this info session. Um, so we, uh, we certainly want to make sure that if you're interested in framing M-State, we make that process as simple and easy as possible. So that's my whole spiel. How's your dining area? Uh, it's great. Yeah, the uh, part of the dining hall just got redone. Um, as I mentioned, like our food and nutrition students kind of keep us on point. Um, the dining facility, uh, there's, there's the all-you-can-eat traditional cafeteria. You sort of swipe in and then you can stay as long as you like. Well, right now you can stay for 90 minutes because of COVID, but normally you can stay as long as you like. And um, there's everything from like salad bar and pizza and burgers and all that stuff. There's typically every meal, there's like a themed dish um, that the chefs prepare. And then there's like sandwiches, all you can eat ice cream, all you can eat cereal, which is my son's favorite part when we go there. Um, and then there's also a spot where you can cook your own food. So they do uh, rice and pasta dishes, like in this sort of little kitchen where students can make their own food, if you like. Uh, and then there's like, there's another spot there where they do like stir fries and things like that too, um, made on demand. So there's a lot of different options on campus. As I mentioned, I think there's seven different places you can get food on campus um, in addition to the traditional all-you-can-eat cafeteria. So. Um, yeah, and as I, as I said, I think they do a fantastic job. We're a Sodexo school, if that, that's important to some students sometimes. Um, uh, one of the advantages is that um, our director of admissions is uh, married to the former director of dining services, so we kind of get a say in making sure that all that looks good. Um, so we're able to recruit students because he's doing such a great job. Um, and then, oh, actually, one, of the, one other thing is that our, our, our entrepreneurship center actually runs a coffee shop on campus as well. So it's a student-run business um, in our science building is a coffee shop that's open in the mornings um, that our business students actually run as part of a project for their entrepreneurship major. So um, what else? What questions do you all have? Yes? The health yeah. science majors? Like, is, okay, so I don't want to make it complicated. So, the only like, thing you have to write cost through is hospitality and tourism. So, hospitality and tourism is more so like working in like hotels, restaurants, tourism, um, like uh, cruise ships, that kind of thing. Um, but we do offer a program, our program in pre health is really geared towards students that maybe want to go to medical school or dental school or physical therapy. Um, so the pre-health concentration, typically within the biology major, um, really prepares students for school after their bachelor's degrees. So one of my favorite tour guides in the past few years is now at, um, at University of North Carolina Medical School. And she knew from like freshman year that she knew she wanted to be a doctor. So she declared a pre-health concentration and then what that does is it gives you all the courses that you need to be able to qualify for medical school. Um, and so that's how we prepare students for like the medical fields after, after their bachelor's degree. Yeah, I love it. Is there any way you can like turn your minor into a major? Uh, it depends on the minor. Um, so like if you're minoring in say um, accounting, that's pretty easy to move because we have an accounting major. Um, a minor like, say, music, we don't offer as a major, but like a music minor, we can move into like communication and performing arts. Um, and so then, you know, some of those minors like fit within majors as well. And then even underneath some of the majors, you might see the minors listed as concentrations. So how about, how about neuroscience? Yeah, so that's actually a concentration within the psychology major. Yeah, and so there's a whole block of cor uh, courses that focus on neuroscience. So you have, um, there's, uh, there's a course on like the brain and pharmacology. There's a course on child development. 
Um, there's a course on like addiction and um, neurotoxins. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole block of courses so that that concentration is usually five or six, four or five, six courses within the major so you can really focus your degree if that's what you want to do. What else? Yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, I totally forgot. Yeah, we do offer study abroad. Um, the past two years have been a little bit weird, as you can imagine. Um, we, I, one, of my, um, one of my students staff almost got stuck, stuck in Italy right at the start of COVID. She was there when everything got shut down. Um, but we offer study abroad programs traditionally in 53 different countries. Um, so everywhere from like Brazil, Costa Rica, Washington, D.C., Italy, France, um, China, Japan, Australia. So um, it kind of depends on your major. Um, but most of the programs are typically, you know, for a semester long um, or even a year long are typically eligible. There's a couple majors where it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, nursing and food and nutrition science in particular because those majors are so specific um, that and a lot of other countries might not meet the requirements that we have here um, for those. Um, but yeah, we have every year we have a couple hundred students who study abroad. Um, we have semester long programs. You could go for the fall, go for the spring. Um, you could also do a full year abroad in some instances. Um, we also offer, uh, like in January, we offer a three week program in India that folk, that's mostly for like our fashion and business majors. Um, and then we also typically every other year in May, we offer a three or four week program that goes to Scotland and England. Um, and that's for like mostly like history, English, sociology, geography majors. Um, and then we have some summer programs. Um, I have a st one of my tour guides this semester. We lost this semester. She's doing uh, a semester in Washington, D.C. as a political science major. Um, and so she's getting, I think she's earning nine credits while she's there. So she's interning, um, I think, with the State Department in Washington, D.C. So it's not even abroad, but it's technically like studying abroad. And we have a program, there's programs in, um, in L.A. and New York City as well. Um, again, for like mostly for like fashion and business majors because those are big hubs for that kind of stuff. So, what else? For athletics, we're NCAA Division three. Um, so it's non-scholarship, but it's still at the NCAA level. I can certainly tell you, I swam here and then I swam Division one and then coached Division Three and Division One, And, you know, the competition level is quite high at all of the levels. Um, the big difference is that at the Division Three level, we just don't offer scholarships. And we mostly see, to be honest, we see, like, in Division Three, we don't see quite as many students who are seniors competing. Like, it tends to be, because sen by senior year, you're kind of doing your internships and all that stuff, and that's sort of a challenge. Um, but also, like Division Three, the other thing that really sets them apart is because there's no scholarship, these are athletes that are really, really dedicated to their sport, right? There's no other incentive for them to compete other than their sense of competition and their enjoyment for the, uh, the sport. So, um, yeah, I actually coached at Elms, Our Lady of the Elms College in Chicopee um, for a couple of years. So, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, having been a college athlete, it's... Uh, I think it's a fantastic experience, like no matter what the level is, even if you're playing like intramurals or club sports, it really just sort of adds to your college experience. It's a great way to like make new friends, meet new people, you know, meet people at other schools, you know, support your school and have some school pride. So, yeah. What else? So there's certainly opportunities to visit. Uh, the cookie has our visit website on the back. Um, so little point of trivia, uh, the, the chocolate chip cookie was actually invented by a Framingham State alum. 
Um, so a class of 1924, um, she, in, she worked at a place uh, called like the Toll House Restaurant. And so that's where the Toll House cookie comes from. Um, so uh, if you come and visit, again, we'll, like, um, we'll waive your application fee for a day, but you'll also get a tour of campus from a student. So you can kind of get the real insight into what's, you know, what school's all about and what a student experience is like. It includes like a full tour of campus. You get to see uh, the residence halls. Um, you certainly can get uh, um, an opportunity to eat in the cafeteria as well and try out the food. Um, so I certainly recommend that you come on a visit. We usually schedule tours like Monday through Saturday. Um, Saturday is usually in the morning. We do have a big open house coming up on November 6th, so about a month from now. Um, there'll be a big open house, and that's uh, like, I think it starts at 9 a.m. on a Saturday, and it goes till about noon, and that's when all the academic departments will have their doors open. Um, you can eat in the cafeteria, um, kind of check out the whole campus, um, you know, as an open house, which is pretty nice. So we haven't hosted an open house in, I think, over 10 years, so this is our first one in a while. Um, but the, uh, even the smaller tours and info sessions are going to be great. Um, there's always an opportunity to talk to someone like myself, an admissions counselor, um, during the info session or afterwards, so we can certainly be there to answer any questions that you have. And then again, you would get a tour from a student, um, so it's kind of great to get some insight into what their lives are like as students rather than hearing from an old guy like me. So, so yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. How are your dorms? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Like, how much do you have to pay? Yeah, so the residence halls, it depends if you have a roommate or not, typically. Um, most of our first year students live in a double room with a roommate, um, and that's typically the most affordable option. Um, all of our residence halls are co ed um, by floor. Um, we also have suite style and sort of apartment style living as well. So you can have three or four bedrooms attached to uh, dedicated bathrooms um, just for your suite. The big difference with those is that those bathrooms, you have to clean those. The facility staff doesn't clean those. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Sometimes students are surprised by that. Um, but our traditional dorms, usually it's a double room, and then you have a larger shared community bathroom that's for... Uh, usually for like 16 or 20 uh, separate dorm rooms. Um, single rooms are obviously more expensive. Um, the Oh yeah, I didn't cover any of this, sorry. Uh, the residents all, whole, all have laundry in the building, um, so you don't have to leave your building to go do laundry somewhere else. Um, they all also have common study areas. Um, they usually have like a game room or a community room as well. Um, some of the newer residence halls have like pool tables, ping pong tables, stuff like that. I think there's a picture, I don't know, it's in our view book, there's a picture of one of them. Um, and on our website, there's a great tour of the residence halls as well. Um, there's a video tour of all of them, so you definitely check that out on our website. Um, the residence halls are also very secure, so you have to use your ID to get into the building, so only people who live there can actually open the doors. Um, you can have guests, though, so if you have a sibling or a cousin or boyfriend or girlfriend coming to visit or something, um, you can have guests in the residence halls. Um, their students get their own mailbox on campus as well, um, and there's also a 24-hour security person at every door. Um, so all of our residence halls have a, a resident assistant or a resident director working security, so even once you're in the building, there's somebody there making sure you're supposed to be there. Um, what else? Uh, oh, and the laundry machines, you can actually use your student ID to pay for. So you can load up your student ID with, um, with money on the card that you can use for, um, for the laundry machines. Um, a couple of the residence halls have kitchens in them as well, full kitchens, so students can prepare their own meals if they like. Um, so um, when you get sick of you know, microwave mac and cheese, um, you can go downstairs and actually make yourself a meal if you want. Um, or if you, you know, don't want to go to the cafeteria, there's plenty of options, too. So, yeah, you had a question. Um, okay, so you said something about you can have guests. Is there, like, a curfew for them to come in and out the building? Yeah, there is some. Um, COVID has kind of changed that a little bit. Um, typically, we do have students, you can come and go 24 hours a day. 
Um, but I think guests, you have to get, you have to get uh, agreement from your roommate that, to host a guest. And then um, I think the maximum they can stay is two nights. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if you have somebody coming for a weekend, you can certainly do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't have to get permission from your roommate to have to have a guest. I think you you might have to get permission from your suite mates. Um, yeah, so the suites are usually three or four bedrooms attached to one or two bathrooms, um, in sort of like almost like a little apartment almost. And then some of them have like a common room or a kitchenette um, in the suite as well. Um, so yeah, and those are that's probably the single rooms in a suite are typically the most expensive option, um, right? Because you're essentially getting a room to yourself. And you're, sorry, it's maybe like a couple, like a thousand or two per year, um, so it's not too too bad. And then we have certainly have students that find uh, opportunities off campus. Um, the the woman who helps me teach my course, um, she has four or five roommates and they like rent an entire house to themselves uh, just off campus. So um, there's certainly, you know, opportunities off campus as well. Typically that's like juniors and seniors might decide to do that um, once they've lived in the dorms for a couple years. So what else? Oh, we didn't talk about diversity at all. Oh my God. Um, so we are, um, as of this year, our freshman class is certainly is one of our most diverse ever with over 35% students of color this year. Um, we are um, an emerging Hispanic serving institution, which means I think this year we're about 17, 18% um, Hispanic and Latino students. Um, the, uh, we have a fairly small international population. So most of our diversity comes within from within Massachusetts. It's mostly, um, Black and African American, Hispanic, Latinx. Um, we have a fair number of Asian and Asian American students, uh, mostly like Indian and Chinese. Um, so it's certainly that adds to the diversity of our campus in terms of perspective and cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Um, a diversity of languages is really important to us too. So um, we have uh, two, I think there's one or two tables in the cafeteria that are dedicated for Spanish speaking students if they want. Um, in addition to like, there's other groups, like there's a, there's a Bible study group in the cafeteria as well that meets once a week. And um, there's some other dedicated affinity group tables within the cafeteria as well. Um, so we want to make sure that you have all the opportunities to continue, you know, to explore and express yourself and your culture like while on campus. And that's really important to who we are as a university. Um, we are certainly, uh, I think, uh, one of the more diverse state universities in New England. Um, and so, and you'll notice it as soon as you walk on campus, like it's, it's not a, it's, although we are a primarily white institution technically, um, we're certainly want to be one of the more diverse uh, campuses uh, for your schools in New England that you're going to step on. So, so yeah, usually I talk about that when we talk about the size of the school, but yeah. What other questions? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so one thing that's a little bit different from many private schools is because our tuition and fees are already uh, quite low and we're subsidized by the tax payers of Massachusetts, it allows us to keep our tuition and fees a little bit lower. Um, but that also means that we, we don't typically hand out giant scholarships. It's typically we're going to use whatever financial aid you're getting from the FAFSA um, and then we're going to sort of figure out what else you're entitled to. Our honors program comes with a merit-based scholarship. So if you're a high achieving student and you're, you want to join the honors program, that comes with a scholarship. Um, in addition to that, we have a variety of other grant and scholarship and loan and payment, plan, plan, payment plans um, available to students. So we help each student kind of, I kind of look at it like a puzzle, like we're helping you piece all of that together. And so some of that might be 
um, grants and scholarships and loans from the federal government. Some of it might be grants, loans, and scholarships from us. Some of it might be a payment plan. Some of it might be a loan that you know somebody else takes out. Um, and so we're going to help you figure all that out together. Um, we do have one big scholarship opportunity that we choose a couple of students for every year. Um, in the uh, in those, if anyone's interested in studying English, uh, the psychology major is is eligible this year. Um, or the humanities, so if you're interested in like studio art or uh, fashion design or um, a bunch of other areas, there's a couple scholarships in that area too. So that's the Mancuso Scholarship and there's a whole page for that on our website. That has a separate application, um, but it covers all of your tuition and fees and your room and board for all four years. Um, but again, it's just a limited number of students each year, so um, that's a very competitive opportunity. So. Um, for in terms of scholarships, um, not specifically. There, there is uh, Massachusetts does have a grant program though that we apply to students that are eligible um, as well. Um, there is we do actually this is one thing that's I think unique maybe about our campus is that we do have a, a cohort of um, first gen staff and faculty with students. So um, if you are a first generation student to go to college. Um, we have faculty and staff that are o that also help manage this affinity group. So students or faculty and staff like myself who were the first in their family to go to school. Um, we there's like sort of like almost like a little sort of support group for that. Um, we also have a program for students that um, are interested in STEM areas. So if you're interested in like the sciences or engineering or math, um, but maybe your math grades aren't um, aren't stellar. We have a uh, we have uh, what we call our STEM scholars, which is an additional sort of separate, smaller program to help you be successful in in those STEM majors, um, if you want. That's an opt-in program if you want to join that group. So, um, so there's a bunch of different ways that we support first gen and, and students that might be, um, you know, have a desire to study in a certain area that need some additional help. So. And then for and then on top of that. For students that are sophomores and above, our alumni association has gives out tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships for students that are not first-year students but sophomores, and there's a separate application for that, and they give out funds every year. For those that are successful and, want to, and we want to reward that success, they reward that success for students that are second years, third years, and fourth years and above. So. Um, for the scholarships or for... Yeah, it's typically, um, for the alumni ones, it's usually a 3.0. Um, for the honors program, uh, they have to maintain a 3.3. Um, and then for enrollment in general, it's a 2. Point, it's a 1.7. So once a student drops below, once a student drops below 1.7, we might ask you to leave and come back, you know, after some coursework somewhere else. So, yeah. And then in terms of admissibility, um, we were, the state does not allow us to admit anyone under a 2.0. So then we would suggest that you go to HCC or STIC or somewhere else first and then join us, you know, after you've done some college coursework, so. Any other questions? And then from HCC, if they want to go to Birmingham, they need to have a certain GPA that's called, right? Yeah, it depends how many credits they've completed. Um, but typically we're looking for like a 2.5. Yeah. And then if you have a C minus or better in the course, it will transfer to Framingham State. So your coursework at HCC, as long as you have a C minus or better, it will come over to Framingham State. And that's going to be true at almost all of the state universities in UMass's, depending upon your major. Yeah, so same thing. A C minus or better will transfer. Okay. Um, we so if you're taking dual enrollment uh, this year, um, definitely make sure that you're getting a C or above. Um, we also calculate those as AP courses, so you get a weighted credit for those. So the better you do at your HCC courses, or if it's at Westfield State or something, we'll actually weight those like we would an AP course. So it'll bring your GPA up. Um, a little bit higher because we, we know that certainly those courses are intended to be more 
challenging than your traditional high school courses. So. Great. Anything else? Well, definitely book a visit um, using the website on the back of the cookie. Um, and as I mentioned, we have an open house on November 6th. Um, you should probably get an invite either in the mail or in your email uh, to November 6th. Um, and that's, again, like going to be, a, I think, just a fantastic day to come check out campus. Um, but certainly come see it now while the leaves are still in the trees. We have a really pretty campus. Um, and so it's like great to sort of see it when it's in its fall beauty, which is pretty nice. So, yeah. Thanks again, guys.